be co-moderated by Dr. Bohr. Dr. Bohr? Yes, Dr. good Bohr. afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to this afternoon's webinar. You may be aware that January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and hence uh, the reason why we are having this specific webinar on cervical cancer. Uh, we shall learn more about cervical cancer, uh, the burden, um, and um, the new targets that we have for screening, uh, as well as uh, the screening uh, modalities that we have. So uh, my name is Dr. Bohr, JP. I'm with the National Cancer Control Program in the Ministry of Health. And uh, this webinar we have organized with uh, Kenyatta National Hospital and uh, other partners in the Stop Cervical Cancer Initiative. And so it is a pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, facilitator for the day, uh, Mr. Robert Rianga. Robert is a registered clinical officer uh, working in Nairobi County. He is a trained uh, trainer of trainers in cervical cancer screening and treatment of precancer lesions. And uh, so he'll be taking us through the session uh, this afternoon. So we will have the session for about, for about uh, 30, maybe 40 minutes or thereabouts. And then we have a Q and A, uh, 15 minutes. Feel free to enter your questions in the Q and A box as well. And we'll address your questions at the end of the webinar. So, uh, Dr. Amina, I think I'll go ahead and welcome Robert to begin the session. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Arimi. I'm trying to share my presentation. So maybe as Robert does that, I will give you a bit more information about the National Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, which is January. Uh, Kenya has uh, commemorated this month since uh, this is the third year running where we are having uh, commemorative events around the Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, previously, uh, many people know October as the cancer month, but uh, cervical cancer is actually number one cancer among women in Kenya in terms of causing deaths. And so uh, it was a shame that we were not commemorating it earlier uh, or using the, the opportunity to create awareness. I see that Robert is ready. Robert, you can go to um, slideshow mode and uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Ari. Um, <clears throat> welcome all for this presentation. Apologies, I have a flu, but I hope uh, you will be able to, to, to hear me and understand what we are, I'm going to present. <clears throat> so this is a cervical cancer screening and treatment sensitization. And I'm going to take you through the epidemiology. Uh, that's the a global epidemiology, the Kenyan epidemiology, and the reason why we will need to screen our women for, for cervical cancer, the fact that it's a, a, a preventable cancer, that now that you know the cause of cervical cancer. In the world, it's the fourth uh, cancer in women <coughs> uh, with a case, new cases of about 570 annually and uh, 311 deaths recorded. And uh, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, it comprises of 13.1% of female cancer deaths that's according to the data of 2018. 90% of deaths occur in less developed countries like uh, our country, Kenya. Uh, most, most of the deaths occur in Africa, actually. And uh, of course, the highest rate being in, in East Africa. When you look at the map, you will see the, 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 the blue color represents those countries with uh, more than 26, <coughs> 26 uh, deaths per 100,000. And actually, Kenya is uh, is at forty per hundred thousand uh, uh, population. 
Now look at the Kenyan uh, burden. Actually, it's one of the it's one, number one cause of cancer deaths in women, and it's the second most common cancer in women. And as we said, it, uh, it, 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 we have around 40 uh, cases per 100,000 women. The screen coverage is very low, low in our country, uh, according to what is in the documented, that, that at 16.4%. So that means we need to uh, do, uh, improve on screening because it's a 100% preventable cancer. Then uh, the other problem is that we have late diagnosis, which also uh, is a constraint to the health system. And late diagnosis, of course, ends up with a poor prognosis. And that's why we are having a number of deaths from, uh, uh, from, from this cancer. You're looking at the incidence, 2012, we had uh, 4,802 cases of cancer. And uh, uh, then you look at the mortality, more than, more than half of those died. In 2018, uh, we had 5,250. Uh, 3,286 died. Uh, that's the more reason why we need to then screen our women as early as possible so that then we can, because it's, it's, it's preventable, it's a preventable cancer now that we know the cause being human papilloma virus. Then we look at the global targets is that the vision of the world is to, uh, to have a, a world without cervical cancer, that all <coughs> countries should reach less than two, four cases per 100 women by the year 2030. So these are the 2030 targets that we have that we need to uh, vaccinate um, we, girls up to 15 years of age, 90% of them. That's what we need to achieve by the year 2030. And then 70% uh, of uh, women are screened with a, a high precision test at the five and for five years of age. And when you talk of high precision tests, uh, among the, the, the screening tests that we have is a HPV testing, which, which is a high precision test. And then 90% of women identified with cervical cancer receive treatment and care. So those are the global targets. And as a Kenyan situation, then we want to incorporate those in us so that then we can achieve that by 2030 or before 2030. <clears throat> So as, we, as I've mentioned earlier, is that we now know that human papilloma virus is the cause for uh, cervical cancer. Actually, 99.7% cases are attributed to human papilloma virus. And we have more than 100 types of human papilloma virus that exist. And among the 100, then we have 13 that are high risk types. And uh, specifically to mention 16 and 18, which are uh, of course, is attributed to more than 70% uh, cases of cancer uh, among us women. So human papilloma virus is also correlated with genital warts and cancer of the anus and penis, vagina and vulva, and orophalnix. Uh, then when we're looking at the risk factors for HPV and cervical cancer development, and uh, uh, of course, HPV type is, is, is one of the risks. If, if it's the high oncogenic type, then it increases the risk. The immunostatus, those with the low, low immunity, the compromised immunity, then they progress much faster and they progress to a cervical cancer because then for them, they will have a, a chronic type of uh, HPV, which will lead to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and those intraepithelial neoplasias can progress to overt cancer. <clears throat> then co-infection with other sexually transmitted infections, multiparity, young age at first uh, birth and uh, tobacco smoking. Of course, tobacco smoking being attributed to most of the carcinomas. Uh, human papilloma virus, of course, is the most common STI worldwide, as we know, and can affect both women and men. Four out of five women, four or people will get HPV at least once in their lifetime. That's a, around 8% chance of acquisition of this virus, being that it's a, a DNA virus, so it's, much, it's very much infectious even with just co uh, body, body contact, genital, genital contact. So nearly all cervical cancers are caused by human papilloma virus, but HPV does not always cause cervical cancer. <clears throat> so through the normal body immunity, most of the infections are, 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 are cleared without any intervention within two years. And then in, in among approximately around 10% of the women, the HPV infection persists and lead to pre cancerous lesions. In, uh, 10, in approximately 10% of cases, of course, of, of those with, uh, with precancerous lesions, they will progress to 
uh, invasive cancer of the cervix. And then we look at the natural history of the cervical cancer, and then we, we have this persistent uh, and chronic high risk infection, which leads to precancerous lesions, which are CIN 1 or 2 or 3, and then which uh, within two, 20, 10 to 20 years it lag, they, they, they are about, so the percentage of them will progress to cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is nearly 100% preventable uh, with screening and treatment for precancerous lesions. So if we, that, that actually gives us the impetus. If we screen our women uh, of reproductive age early and manage those with CIN lesions, then we'll be able to uh, uh, prevent this cancer and also vaccinate our young, young girls up to age of 15 who have not had their sex debut. Uh, these are the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. Of course, most of us are, uh, may, may, may come close of this. Uh, of course, most of mostly it usually does not have symptoms at, at its early stages, but then some of the symptoms that you will see in later stages is abnormal vaginal bleeding, uh, which could be during the, the time they're having sex. It could also be having postmenopausal bleeding or heavy bleeding in between periods. And then also abnormal vaginal discharge uh, and, and then discomfort in the back, leg, pelvis, abdomen, and, or, uh, or after having sex. So those are some of the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer. Now in cervical cancer prevention, then we have to uh, approach it through primary prevention, second prevention, and tertiary prevention. Under primary prevention, we are targeting young women, young girls, sorry, of age nine to 14 years. And basically Kenya, I think one, one more than a year ago, we started vaccinating young girls of 10 years. And uh, we, the age of course is nine to 14 that we are targeting. And then also offer education to young girls and boys on health information, appropriate sexuality education and use of condoms and male circumcision. Of course, male circumcision has also been attributed to a reduction in number of infections. And so, so it prevents these young men from also acquiring uh, later in uh, uh, penile cancer, sorry. Then secondary prevention, we, we here now, we, we are assuming that all women have been infected with HPV infection, those who have not been vaccinated. And now we want to screen them for pre lesions, the CI and the cervical tributary neoplasia. And then we, we, we treat. So the approach is that we screen and treat, and that should be a single visit approach. And for us to achieve that, then we have to do the visual inspection using uh, either acetic acid or lugosiodine. The other that you can do is point of care rapid HPV testing, uh, which of course screens those for those who have been or who have chronic infection, and then we can go ahead and visual, do visual methods and then go ahead and treat. And then uh, tertiary prevention now, here we are meeting those women who already have invasive cancer. We want to treat them by offering uh, uh, either through radiotherapy, chemotherapy, or palliative care, depending on the stage of their cervical cancer. So uh, in second prevention, and that's where most, uh, because we only started primary prevention the other year, we, that's where we'll focus ourselves on, where, whereby we'll be screening for uh, abnormal cy cytology. By, so we have the screening methods that you use in our country. We have the cervical cytology, which is pap smear that has been there since memorial. And uh, we, it has also its only limitations also. And uh, no wonder we have that little coverage in terms of screening. Then visual inspection with acetic acid uh, or uh, visual inspection using v acetic acid and the lugosiodine. Then the also HPV testing for high risk HPV types. Uh, you know, the program had a pilot study and uh, we, 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 the program intends to roll out this uh, if funds available single visit. See and treat method is what is recommended whereby you do a visual inspection using acetic acid. And then if they have lesions that um, meet the criteria for cryotherapy, you can do cryotherapy. Those lesions that are large or extending to the cervical canal, you can refer, refer them for, for other methods like uh, loop electrosurgic acquisition procedure. <clears throat> the other method that you can use is thermocoagulation to treat such lesions. So we want to look, just look at the overview of uh, the anatomy and the physiology of the cervical of cervical of the cervix, yeah. And uh, this is the overview of female anatomy. 
of course the surrounding organs of the, of the cervix of course the cervix is uh, is 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 is, is um, a continuation of the uterus and so an opening to the uterus uh, for you to access the cervix of course you have to pass through the vagina by by speculum examination the other organs here are like the ovaries the endometrium the fallopian tubes <clears throat> Now the cervix, just overview of what the, the, the anatomy of the cervix and the, why it's important for us when we are screening, then we want to know the endocervix and the ectocervix. The endocervix is actually uh, the area above the uh, external os and which opens into the uterus and, and it, it has a canal which is called endocervical canal. This endocervix is lined by simple uh, columnar epithelium that secrete mucus. These simple columnar epithelium cells are a single layer of cells. And when you insert a speculum, of course, uh, you'll see a red, uh, red, red color of, of, of the cells. And then the ectocervix is part of the cervix beyond the external os, lined with non keratinizing stratified squamous septilium, readily visible in speculum examination. So the squamous septilium is. Um, they are flat cells, uh, as they explain themselves. They are flat cells that are arranged in layers, layers of up to 15 to 20 layers. And for, for, because they filter light, then they, they, when you look at them, when you insert your speculum, you see uh, it, a light pink color. They are light pink color. Uh, so where, where, where they meet, we see the endocervix. Um, normally the endocervix, uh, as it's, as we've said, discovered by simple columnar epithelium and the ectocervix is squamous epithelium. But then, because of the cervical changes that happen due to swelling of the cervix during pregnancy, or when we have estrogen levels that are high, then the endocervix averts outside, and the, you can see simple columnar epithelium at the ectocervix in certain circumstances. Of course, we will see some of the photos uh, where you will see. Uh, columnar epithelium at, at the ectocervix. It's a picture, a, just explanation of what I've tried to explain. So the two types of cells, I said the columnar epithelium is, uh, in, is arranged in columns and a single layer of cells, and the other one is flat cells that are arranged in layers of 15 to, to 20 layers. And where they meet is the squamocolumnar junction. And the fact that uh, there is all, there will always be swelling there will be swelling up because of pregnancy, the, 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 the endocervix everts into the ectocervix. Remember we said that the endocervix is, made, uh, uh, is lined by this columnar epithelium, which is a single layer of cells. This single layer of cells may not with, will not withstand the acidic environment of the vagina. So the body physiological, physiological will, uh, will, will, will do squamous metaplasia, which will cover the, the, the columnar epithelium that is, has been exposed. And that condition where columnar epithelium is at the ectosurface is what we call ectopy. And uh, physiologically, the body will try to cover uh, with the uh, squamous cells so that then it protects this columnar epithelium. We say it's a single layer of cells, it cannot withstand the environment of the, of the, of the vagina. Uh, you can see this, this, is, this is columnar epithelium which has, uh, because of swelling of the cervix, has averted outside. So transformation starts. That's metaplasia starts. And the metaplasia will start from the, 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 where the, we have uh, the squamocolumina junction towards the host because we want to protect these cells. So it's a, it's a, a normal physiological uh, uh, whatever. Uh, fu function that happens to protect this column epithelium. And uh, that's where, uh, of course, dysplasia happens, where there is transformation, where there is metaplasia is where dysplasia happens. And that's why I'll tell you that, that we, the area between the, 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 the whatever, where we had the, the original squamocolumina junction, and the presence of columnar junction is what is called uh, the transformation. So now I'll explain later on some other pictorial. So this is just a pictorial to show the squamocolumnar junction where the two types of cells meet. Remember the squamous epithelium here. These are the squamous cells. These are the flat cells arranged in layers of 15 to 20. Uh, 
These are columnar epithelium. It's a single layer of cells. You see the basement membrane. Under the basement membrane, membrane of course, is the stroma where we find blood vessels and others. And because of uh, this one filter light, so it's pink in color. This one does not filter light, so you see the red vessels. And it's red in color when you look at it. Now, uh, I'll try to explain this, the transformation zone. Now, we, uh, as I mentioned, is that the cervix swells due to the influence of estrogen or due to pregnancy. Uh, and if it swells, then it averts the endocervical uh, cells out. That is the column epithelium. So you find that initially when it swells, the endocervical can, the, the ectocervix was covered with the column epithelium up to this area here. And then now immediately, but of course, we'll try, try to do transformation. That is succumous so metaplasia to cover these cells because we say these cells may not withstand this and will not extend, withstand the environment in the cervix because of its acidity and other, all the other activities that happen there. So um, that then there is squamous metaplasia that happens throughout uh, until we uh, there the, the, is metaplasia up to the os to cover the the, the this columnar epithelium. So this is or the old trans squamous columnar junction where there was the, the meeting point between the squamous epithelium and the columnar epithelium. And now we have the present, which is here, current squamous columnar junction, whereby the pink, pink uh, tissue and the, whatever, the pink tissue and the red tissue meet. That is the, our squamous columnar junction. We'll see some, some photos of, uh, of live uh, cervix, which we'll, we'll be able to, I will be able to demonstrate to you. So this is a cervix, of course. Uh, you can appreciate the light pink color here, all over here. And then there's the red color here. So this red color is where we have columnar epithelium. This light pink color is where we have the squamous epithelium. Where they meet here, 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 all around, is our squamous columnar junction. That is very important when you are doing visual uh, inspection. Uh, using uh, whatever, whether you're using acetic acid or lugosiodine. So the appear appearance of a normal cervix, the, 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 we have variations of normal cervix. So the cervix number A is, uh, the host is spin point. You can see uh, probably this woman has never had uh, a baby or if you had a baby through abdominal delivery and this one has had, you can see the cervix. So there the are various variations of normal cervix. Now, uh, we talked about cervical ectopy. Now looking at this cervix, cervix B, you can see there is, the, 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 because of the swelling of the cervix, there is a version of columnar epithelium, this uh, red, you see the red, red color here, this is columnar epithelium that is supposed to be in the endocervix, but because of the swelling of the cervix and the deservation, then you find columnar epithelium at the ectocervix, and this condition is called ectropion. The same case applies to this one, and the same case applies to this one. I want to I want us to appreciate this. There's a pale pink color cells around the near the columnar junction. These are metaplastic squamous epithelium. Metaplastic squamous epithelium is pale pink in color, especially newly formed. Uh, this is another normal cervix with, uh, of course, a, 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 a cervical polyp. There's a cervical polyp here. There's another one here. Of course, this one got injured a bit with the speculum. Uh, there's a cervical polyp here. There's a cervical polyp here. Now, when there's one transformation is happening, um, remember I, they, I didn't mention about columnar epithelium. The function of the columnar epithelium is to produce mucus. Actually, they are, they are, they are mucin producing cells. So <clears throat> even with the transformation, that is metaplasia, uh, squamous metal, overgrowth of squamous epithelium on top of the columnar epithelium, the, the columnar epithelium will continue uh, producing they will continue their function of producing mucus. And because of the overgrowth of squamous epithelium, uh, the mucus will be trapped inside. 
and that is what we call Nabothian Folkos. So wherever you see Nabothian Folkos, you know transformation happened. That's we are within the transformation zone. You know that that area initially was covered with the columnar epithelium and transformation happened or uh, squamous metabolism happened. And that's why you, you, are, you are seeing. So the Nabothian Folkos we are talking about are this, this one here, this one here, another one here for sub B. So we see, you can see a big one here and and multiple ones down here on service D uh, that are small. So when you see uh, Nabothian follicles, you know you're within the transformation zone, especially for us, we are doing vision inspection without uh, the aid of colposcopy. So, uh, and you know, transformation zone, we said is the area where your dysplasia happens. So atrophic epithelium, uh, this is also normal for women, postmenopausal women, who now, because of the lower estrogen levels, they, they atroph their cervix atrophies. And if you see part, part of the ectocervix now uh, going inside, yeah? You, the part of the ectocervix is inside into the endocervix. And for these women then, we cannot screen them using the, the visual uh, methods. The, for them, they call, you can use, you can do cytology because if you are not able to visualize the squamocolumnar junction, then you don't do visual uh, inspection using either acetic acid or lugosiodine. So for this one, they can benefit from uh, cytology, pap smear. So another example of normal cervix, uh, of course, with a, a mucus plug, you can see the mucus plug here. I told you that columnar epithelium, the, the, the main function is to produce mucus. So you find that women have mucus plugs at their hose. And mucus plug, when applied with logo, uh, acetic acid, also acetyl whites. So you have for you to identify a lesion from a mucus plug, mucus plugs are movable. Lesions are not movable. Uh, this is another normal with the uh, IUCD in certain. This is a cervix that is inflamed. You can see red all over. It's just inflamed all over. The difference between this one and the ectopy is that in in in, in inflamed cervix, that's cervicitis, the cervix is inflamed all over. The other one has demarcation you can see clearly. Now, I'll just just to mention is that because this is vision inspection with acetic acid, it's a very uh, it's an easy procedure. It's a procedure that is affordable that we can be able to be can be be done by a healthcare worker at low even lower levels who are trained to do so that then you can achieve uh, the the goals that we've been given by the the, the goals by the WHO that is uh, the, the screening of uh, more, more than seventy percent of women of uh, age between thirty five and forty five and that's why we want to talk about this one vision inspection using acetic acid. The basically because it can be done even into the lower levels, and it's uh, as we said, it's um, you, you, you it, the, the plants are able to be given results there and there, and then for those with lesion, they can be treated even in the with the, the, the other healthcare workers. So it doesn't need specialized uh, uh, care. So that's the reason why we will talk about this. Acetic acid is readily available and it's not expensive. So the procedure is that you need to cancel the clan and obtain informed consent. You look at the cervix and visualize the transformation zone that you've been talking about. The squamocolumnar junction, uh, which is very key because if you're not able to visualize the squamocolumnar junction, then you cannot do visual, uh, visual methods, including with acetic acid. Then you apply or you wash um, generously with uh, acetic acid three to five percent and uh, you wait for one minute that should be one complete minute and then observe the findings then we'll be able to see the characteristics of the of a, of a positive acetic acid of a positive sorry lesion via positive sorry so when we want to look at the color and uh, look at the lesion is, is is the lesion an opaque white color you look at the borders are the borders uh, of the lesion distinct because the borders of the lesion must be distinct. The color must be opaque, not faint. The location, the, the lesion must be located within the transformation zone, not lesions far away from the transformation zone. And actually it should even, 
It should also touch the squamocolumnar junction. The thickness is the lesion raised above the surrounding tissue. So lesions can, uh, can always be either flat or raised above the surrounding tissue. So the, the clinical findings for VIA category, when you look at the test, for test negative VIA, you know, then there's no acetyl white. If there's no acetyl white, then that's negative. Or there could also be some acetyl white, but it's faint acetyl white. That can occur on the polyps, can occur when somebody has cervicitis, can occur when somebody has inflammation or an abothian cyst that also acetyl white sometimes. Um, remember, acetic acid coagulates with cellular proteins, and those cellular proteins are much higher in uh, those lesions. The, 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 okay, so by contraptelian neoplasia uh, lesions. So test positive, they, 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 they must have a well-defined, distinct, well-defined and sharp uh, margins, and should be opaque or dull or oyster white, uh, acetyl uh, white areas. They may have raised or flat, uh, raised on margins, or they may not be raised, and they should be touching the squamocolumnar junction. Uh, leukoplakia and warts that also uh, uh, that, that are within the transformation zone that are the white also have positive lesions. Suspicious for cancer, of course, we are talking about ulcerative, proliferative growth, uh, could be cal cal cauliflower-like growth or ulcer, good, which could be oozing or bleeding on touch. <clears throat> Those are the findings for VIA. Now, VIA positive example, looking at this cervix, this cervix was applied with uh, acetic acid. And as you can see, uh, this is the this is our squamocolumnar junction. The squamocolumnar junction was around here at the os. And uh, after application of acetic acid, sorry, uh, there is acetyl whitening. With a lesion with very clear margins, you can see uh, they seem to be raised. Uh, of course, there's a reflection of light here, but you can see the lesion all around. Yeah, and that means this is positive for VIA. And then you, you know you look at the criteria whether this gland is can be treated using cryotherapy or thermocoagulation, which are can be done even by the lower cadre of healthcare workers who are trained. Then another VIA positive example, yeah, you can see our squamocolumnar junction. Remember I told you the squamous cells are pink, light pink in color. You can see them here around. Then there is columnar telum, which is red. You can see the red cells here. And then the junction is here all around like that. And then after application of acetic acid, sorry, uh, there is acetyl white lesion that starts from here, goes up, 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 like that, like that, like that. Yeah, so the, this is VI positive, there's a lesion there. Okay, uh, there's another VI positive here. You can see the pink color, the red, the squamocolumnar junction is around here, all around here. Yeah, you can see the lesion is starting from the squamocolumnar junction, extending upwards like that. There's some reflection, but you can appreciate that's the lesion for, for positive lesion, yes. Uh, there's another one here that seems to be a lesion. I'm not aware whether it could be uh, maybe uh, whatever, mucus plug from this hose, or it could be the lesion. But for you to be sure, then you need to move it. If it's moving, then that is a mucus plug. If it's not moving, then that's a lesion. Now, suspicious for cancer, we said it's an proliferative growth. Uh, could be color, uh, whatever, cauliflower and like uh, growth. Uh, this, this one you cannot miss, it's, you can't miss. Um, and we said it's easily bleed. You can look at the lesions, they are bleeding on touch. This is the cauliflower uh, like uh, growth on the cervix. It's suspicious for cancer. We say suspicious because it has to be confirmed. So for these glands, uh, they have to be referred for biopsy and also staging. <clears throat> so the, the strengths and the limitations of VIA, of course, VIA is a low cost procedure that can be done at even lower levels, easy to execute, and you have quick results and you make a decision whether you have, if they have a lesion, whether you're going to treat or you're going to refer. Limitation of course, 
is highly subjective because it's what I see, it's what you see. It's very subjective and it can be, you see, you cannot, with very low uh, quality controls because it's very subjective. Now, um, the national guideline is that uh, we have got the algorithm for HPV testing. As I told you that we have HPV testing as one of the screening tests and it should be the primary screening test actually. But the problem is that uh, it's not readily available and it's expensive, could be expensive for, that it cannot be, individuals may not afford unless the government offers it free. Uh, but now VIA is uh, what is managed because it's, uh, it's, it's affordable. The acid acid is affordable. You can write on the other procedures that we are doing in our facility, like spec, uh, whatever, where, whatever we are inserting speculum into the uh, vagina and screen them. So for VIA, uh, the, the algorithm is that for those who are negative, we will, after you've done VIA, you will screen them after every, every, every five years. And for those who are HIV positive because of the immunostatals, then for them we say that should be they should be screened every uh, one year. For positive, uh, they, we have treatment options. Those who are eligible for cryo or thermocoagulation, you treat. Those not eligible for cryo or thermocoagulation, you treat with leave. After treatment, of course, post-treatment screening should be one year after treatment. Those with suspicious can for cancer, you refer them for appropriate diagnosis and uh, management. So the two easily uh, treatment options that we have that can be performed by lower cardiac healthcare workers uh, are cryotherapy and the thermocoagulation. And both of them, of course, you are using either cold or heat to, uh, to, to, to destroy the precancerous cells. For thermo, for cryo, sorry, you are using, you are freezing the cells, you are freezing the cervix. You are destroying both the precancerous lesion and much of the cells at the transformation zone so that then you destroy the cells. And we are using medical grade CO2, uh, uh, depending on the machine that you have and also nitrous oxide. Uh, then you, you do double freezing, it's a double freezing procedure whereby you freeze for three minutes, then you leave it to thaw for five minutes, then again you freeze for three minutes and you are done. Uh, this is the cryotherapy units uh, uh, that we use, uh, depending again from the manufacturer. The, 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 oper uh, the operation is nearly the same for, for those that have seen. Okay, and then post cryotherapy, after cryotherapy, of course, after freezing the uh, cervix, it forms an ice ball. You can see the ice ball in this cervix here. This is the ice ball. So you achieve cryonecrosis by freezing. So the, the, the cells die. And then this is a cervix in mid, uh, several, sorry. This is a cervix that are stored, sorry. This one here, after cryotherapy. Thermocoagulation, of course, you achieve uh, uh, necrosis by, by destroying the transformation zone using the temperatures between 100 and 120 degrees Celsius. It's a 30 minutes procedure. It's actually easier uh, if you compare it with thermo, with the cryo, so cryo takes longer time and the thermo, thermo is only 30 seconds and you are done and you can uh, do multiple applications. This is the thermocoagulation unit. Uh, of course, it depends on the manufacturer. This is from TC, this is called TC. We have another one uh, from another different company. The even operation-wise, is they are a bit different in terms of operating them. So it's always you need to, under, to to read the instructions before you use them. And this is pre. This is the service before the thermocoagulation was done. This one here, and uh, this is immediately after. This is the image a month after thermocoagulation. You know, granulation has happened and the the, the, the cervix is healing. So post-treatment instructions is that the patient should avoid having sex. That's now for, for both cryo and, uh, and thermo. They should avoid sex for four weeks. And uh, if they are, they are not able to abstain, then they need to use condoms. 
in the individual woman is treated for cryotherapy or thermocoagulation, uh, the, the follow-up, of course, we said earlier, it's one year. Side effects of cryo in the time, of course, for every procedure, for every procedure that you do in hospital has side effects. Of course, we'll have uh, short lasting, mild, lower uh, level abdominal cramps, uh, water liver or discharge that lasts four to six weeks, spotting uh, and light bleeding that lasts one to two weeks. And then we have danger signs. These, these, these are signs that will make you tell the client to come back immediately or call back to the facility, uh, like fever, that persists for two to, to more than two days. Sorry, severe lower abdominal pain with the, that, that can be accompanied by uh, fever, bleeding for two more than two days that is heavier than your heaviest days of menstrual bleeding, bleeding with clots, but then you discharge with a false smell. Of course, all this showing either uh, mostly because of infection. So if a client has this uh, danger sign, then they need to re need to report back to the facility. And these side effects and the uh, the instructions and danger signs are supposed to be uh, documented for the client to always remember. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that the cervix has a poor innervation sensory to cold and uh, heat. Uh, for that reason, then you don't need an anesthesia when you're doing these procedures. Thank you. And that's the end. Thank you very much. That was a very, very um, insightful um, show. So Dr. Bor, you want to take us through the questions? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. That was very insightful. And I just wanted to also highlight uh, to the participants that this uh, is really just a sensitization. Uh, training on cervical cancer screening is usually a three to five day training. So it is not possible to cram everything into uh, about an hour session. So we'll move on to the questions. And uh, I uh, commend Robert for doing a very good job in covering the topic. Robert, some of yes. the questions here, uh, yeah. you I want to answer. Can a girl who is 15 years and below still be vaccinated against HPV, regardless of whether or not she's sexually active? OK, um, I, I want to try and say, if girls are sexually active, it means they've been exposed to HPV infection. The fact that uh, the prevalence of HPV infection is very high and the chances of having HPV infection is uh, up to 80%. So if you, for example, if you give, uh, uh, of course, the target is um, nine and 14, that's less than 15 years. But then uh, we, 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 it's an assumption. We, we don't ask such questions, especially when you're doing the 10 years old. We don't ask questions whether they're sexually active. It's an assumption that uh, they are not sexually active and the majority of them will not be sexually active. So for, from the public health point of view, then you want to vaccinate all of them. Of course, those who've been exposed already to HPV, the vaccine will not work. Yes, uh, in addition, um, there are many strains of HPV and uh, well, the the vaccine may may provide um, you know immunity against uh, a strain that the person has not been exposed to. So while the national program is uh, going for ten year old girls for public health impact, in other countries the um, vaccine is open even for older women if they want to pay for it. So uh, for the national program, it's for the ten year old girls and. It is not uh, the, the whether or not they're sexually active is not an issue. There's another question about how the uptake of the HPV vaccine has been. I recall a lot of skepticism when it was initially talked about in the country. Uh, perhaps I can attempt to take this one, and uh, perhaps also Robert can comment from his experience working in the county. Uh, I know from a national level that uh, at around, by around November last year, the uptake for the first uh, dose of the vaccine, you're aware that the vaccine is given in two doses, uh, six months apart. So the first one, for the first dose, the coverage nationally was at about 70% or thereabouts. So uh, for the second one, there was there's also the challenge of coronavirus, which came in, the pandemic also negatively impacted on the uptake of the vaccine, especially since it had been linked 
uh, with schools. The vaccine was being provided at, uh, is provided at health facility. It is a facility-based program, uh, but uh, the schools were mapped to the facilities and uh, that was helping to track who has received the vaccine and who hasn't. So I think the uptake was really affected, but I know that my colleagues at the National Vaccines and Immunization Program are doing a lot to mop up uh, you know, those who are not uh, vaccinated and uh, uh, Lala Robert comment from the county, how, if uh, he can say how it has been. Uh, I will say that I don't have any current information about HPV vaccine uptake. So of okay. course, as you mentioned, Dr. Ali, is that uh, many factors are affected, including people being pessimistic about the vaccination. So of course we'll get, I know we'll have a review, data review national, looking at the target population, the numbers that we targeted and how many uh, uh, received and then the way forward. But I don't know, but I know they, they, the uptake may, have, may not have been very good. Okay. The next question, is it possible for the PDFs to be shared to emails? How can we get these slides? I think we will make arrangements with the KNH team uh, to share the slides, Dr. Amina. Yes, I guess the people who want it to be personal, it to be shared, they can just drop an email with KNH Research. Okay, another question here, Robert. Yes. If a man has sexual relations with a woman who has invasive cervical cancer, can he be infected? And can he transmit the HPV to another woman he has sex with? Yes, I will say yes. Um, of course, we know that it, uh, cervical cancer is now caused by HPV and the oncogenic types that we are talking about. Uh, if a man has a sexual relation with a woman who has invasive cancer, they can easily transmit the virus. But however, I will say this, it depends on the past exposure and whether this woman, this man, because there's that natural history of the, the virus. If the man has antibodies against the, this virus, then he may not contract the virus from this woman. So he may not transmit, so it depends. But I will say for a man who does not have, for example, if, if, if the, woman, the man was exposed to type 16 sometime back, uh, he could develop antibodies against type 16, even if he gets exposed to type 16 in future, he may not get the infection. But for if there are, remember there are other subtypes that are men. There is eighteen. There is there are other other eleven more types. So a, a man can get this infection from this woman and transmit it to to another woman. Uh, maybe I don't know, doctor, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I uh, I don't have much to add. We can look at the next question. At what point is this hysterectomy recommended? Okay. Um, at what point is this hysterectomy recommended? You want to answer that, Robert? No, no, because I'm not very sure about that. That's not mm. invasive cancer, and we are doing cervical cancer yeah. prevention. For yes, uh, hysterectomy may be recommended uh, for <laughs> some early stages of cervical cancer. Uh, but I think we will uh, propose another webinar on treatment of cervical cancer and we will get a gynecologist or gynecologist oncologist to gynecological oncologist to cover uh, the topic of cervical cancer uh, treatment. Sure. How about cysts? What causes patholine cysts? That is the next question. I don't know. Is she talking about patholine sepsis? Yeah, I think so. That's infection. Button and sepsis yeah. are caused by infection. Yeah. I don't want the, the participant to confuse the mm -hmm. Nabothian cysts that we talked about yes. and the Bartholine cysts. Bartholine uh, are usually at the, uh, at, at the, at the vulva uh, outside here. And then when we talk about the, the, the Nabothian cysts, they are the cervix. And we said the importance of Nabothian cysts is to, they guide us. They, when you see an Nabothian cyst, you know you are within the transformation zone. You know, uh, metaplasia happened there. Okay. I hope that is clear. The next question, does a via positive test mean that the patient has cancer of the cervix? 
Uh, no. A via positive test means that the patient has cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, has neoplasia that is within the epithelium of the cervix. And that is manageable using the methods that we talked about, that's thermal or cryo. Those with invasive cancer have lesions that have extended from the epithelium to other uh, tissues. I think what may be causing confusion is the words neoplasia. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think it is good to be clear that there is a cervical, what we call the cervical precancerous lesions. There's that stage when it is not cancer, it is not invasive cancer. Yes. And then there's the stage when it is invasive cancer. Yes. VI is used for screening, which is used to find the pre-cancer stage. So it does not mean at all that the patient has cancer of the cervix. Yeah. Is it okay to perform cryotherapy to women with positive lesion to women with fibroid? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay to perform cryotherapy to women with a positive lesion? I think it's a woman with a positive lesion and they have a fibroid. fibroid Is yes. it okay to, to do cryotherapy? I don't think it's a contraindication. You can still go ahead. Fibroids happen in the uterus. The lesions are on the, uh, the epithelium of the cervix. So you can go ahead and uh, uh, perform cryotherapy. Okay. Maybe um, to add on is that mm -hmm. women that we may not do cryotherapy or thermocoagulation are women with evidence of PID, cervicitis, women who are pregnant. Yeah, for those we cannot. After how long should we review an HIV positive client with via positive post treatment? After how long should we review HIV positive with via positive post treatment? So um, it's just the same as other clients. So it's not different. It's after one year, that's when you do a post, post treatment uh, uh, screening for, for them. There's a question here about uh, CPD points. I think I'll allow Dr. Amina to address that when we finish the uh, questions on the subject matter. Dr. Amina, you will tell us about the CPD, CPD points. We have a comment uh, from Fanny Nelima saying that that was a great presentation. Thank you. Catherine is asking, is the HPV vaccine available in all hospitals? And there's another question, how effective is the vaccine against HPV? I'll attempt this one. Um, on the HPV vaccine being available in all hospitals, yes. HPV vaccine is available in all government hospitals at all levels of care. And it is targeting the 10 year old girls. It is free for them. And it is, it, um, it is a safe and effective vaccine. Uh, this vaccine has been used in many countries in the West and even in Australia for a number of years. And it has been shown that uh, the cases of cervical cancer have dropped in those countries, as you have seen in the maps that uh, Robert shared earlier in the first few slides of the presentation when he was going through the burden. Those countries with uh, low burden uh, have been very successful in screening and they also introduced the HPV vaccine early in, uh, earlier and uh, the vaccine is safe and it is effective. Another question here on thermocoagulation and cryotherapy. When you freeze, when you freeze or thermocoagulation, will it affect the mucus levels? And then the other question is on the CPT points. So Maybe I'll try that one about mucus level. I don't know whether she means the, 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 the cervical mucus or... Yes, I think so. Because what happens is that after thermocoagulation, of course, there is increased the vaginal discharge because of a necrosis that happens. And that lasts from, from one to two weeks. Uh, no, from two weeks to four weeks. But about... Uh, the mucus, the normal mucus from the endocervical canal, that will continue because you are not freezing the cells of the endocervical canal. Okay. 
Margaret asks, um, is cervical cancer sexually transmitted? <laughs> that is always a trick question. Sure, sure. Uh, what, what can we say, Doctor? I think. I yeah. think uh, HPV vaccine is, I mean, HPV itself is the cause of cervical cancer, 99.7%. And yes, HPV is sexually transmitted, but it is difficult to say uh, cervical cancer is sexually transmitted. And we try and steer away from that conversation where it is a sexuality issue to make it an issue that it is, it is cancer and it is a preventable cancer. Uh, the, the problem with uh, really, well, in a sense it is, but can we shift our focus for advocacy purposes to the fact that cervical cancer is, is a preventable cancer? Can we make that more of our focus and what needs to be done to prevent it? In which case, we have the tools, we have the HPV vaccine, we have the screening, we have the early diagnosis and treatment of the precancer lesions, and even treatment of early cancer with uh, cure. So can we focus more uh, for the sake of the general public and for the sake of educating them? If you are to pass a message to them, then I would rather you focus more on telling them that it is a preventable cancer and what they did need to do to prevent it. The next question is, what is the Kenya recommendation for cervical cancer screening age bracket? Uh, I think I'll just quote from the national screening guidelines. It is 25 to 49 years. The national screening guidelines are available online. Just Google and see uh, if, and you'll just find them. The other question, the other, there's a comment. Thanks for the good presentation, Robert. Any data on, HPV, on coverage of HPV vaccine in Kenya currently and how accessibility is it? I think I already commented about that. And on the accessibility, I think if you reach out to uh, the National, National uh, Vaccines and Immunizations Program, you'll be able to share that data with you. Another... If, if I may, if I may, uh, Dr. Bor, okay. mm -hmm. uh, there's some question regarding management, like uh, at one point is hysterectomy recommended. Yes. I would yes. kindly request next week, we're going to have a webinar with the, a gyne oncologist we, he can he will he's going to have all those questions so if we can Excellent. speak more about the screening yes. and uh, yes. yeah we we will just address the questions on screening for today okay thank Excellent. you thank yeah. you thank you doctor so there's a question here on screening screening is a big issue as most women do not want uh, the speculum most women do not want the speculum procedure is there a way hpv can be checked through blood Oh, through, through blood tests. Robert, you want to take that? No, we don't have a blood test for HPV. Mm -hmm. Even if you had to do HPV test, you have to collect a sample from the cervix. Uh, so, 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 so blood test not available at the moment. Yes, there's no blood test, but the good news is that HPV, uh, the sample can be collected uh, by the client herself. Yes. So there's a possibility of self sampling yeah. and it is available uh, in country. And uh, so I think that is usually preferred uh, compared, it has been shown to be more acceptable than a provider collected sampling. If a cervix is bleeding on touch, do you continue with VIA or do PAP? And I think you can combine that, Robert, with this yes. one. What sort of reaction occurs between the cervical cancer and acetic acid in VIA? Okay, I, a cervix that is bleeding, one, one question that we need to ask ourselves, why should a cervix bleed and touch? Uh, it could either be the client has um, invasive cancer, or it could be you injured, especially for patients, clients with um, Columnar telium at the ectopy. When you are opening your speculum, you can easily injure the 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 the, 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 the site. So if it's not invasive cancer, you can go ahead and screen. You just wipe out the blood and uh, apply acetic acid, and you observe the changes. But if it's uh, invasive cancer, you don't even need to go ahead and apply acetic acid. If it's invasive cancer, it's invasive cancer. You suspect, you, well, okay. If it's suspicious for cancer, sorry, may not say invasive cancer. If it is suspicious for cancer, 
you don't need to go ahead and apply acetic acid. There's no, there's, there's no reason for acetic acid here. You just report as suspicious for cancer and refer. On the reaction between uh, acetic acid and the cervix? And the cervix? Yes. Acetic acid, as I said earlier, is that acetic acid uh, coagulates with cellular proteins. And those cellular proteins are much more in uh, CRN lesions or precancellous lesions. So that's why they acetyl white. Okay. Um, let me see. There's a question on colposcopy. What is colposcopy and what is it used for? And then, yeah, take that one, Robert. Okay. About colposcopy, of course, you are using a colposcopy machine for you, for you to visualize the cervix better. Uh, because a it magnifies the cervix so that you're able to visualize. Now, when you're using a colposcopy machine, you're able to identify the structures we talked about where the, uh, you, it's easy for you to know where, for example, a, a crypt opening is, uh, where, where, where the, the original squamous columnar junction was. So it magnifies, it makes it better uh, visible than, than when you are using just naked eyes. And maybe that's a little knowledge I have about colposcopy. Doctor, do you have anything you want to add about colposcopy? Uh, I think, it, as you have said, it is, uh, it is used uh in cervical cancer screening where it's where you use a, an instrument, that instrument called a colposcope, which magnifies the image at the cervix and helps uh, to identify, uh, you know, whether it's a precancer lesion or not and to move to the next uh, level. You can see more in the screening guideline where there's an algorithm for, for HPV and an algorithm for pap smear. Uh, I may not want to say more than that. There's a question here. Patient comes to the facility with thick brown, foul smelling, vaginal discharge. She's put on medication. It stops but recurs less than two weeks later with severe abdominal pain. Could this be signs of cervical cancer? You can try that, that doctor. Pardon? You can try that one. Oh, okay. Could that be cervical cancer? <laughs> yes, it. I think um, for that one, I think you just need to to do as to screen the woman, mm. screen them and see. Uh, you know, it's it won't be very hard for you to do a, a VIA, and that will tell you if you insert a speculum, you'll be able to see if there's a an obvious um, an obvious suspicious lesion. So I think yeah. and if, if, if I may add, because I worked in an outpatient uh -huh. facility for a very long time, uh, a lot of people tend to ignore such symptoms and just give them like a candid or give them antibiotics or what have you. Kindly ask these people how frequent they do these things. Ask them if they've had a pap smear or if they've had any BIA. Uh, let's, let's actively engage patients on doing a cervical screening because that's a lot of healthcare workers take it for granted. In fact, I think even us healthcare workers, we need to ask ourselves, have you had your screening? You know, we just assume a lot of things when we can do much better. So for that particular patient, uh, it might be infection, it's most likely an infection. However, uh, you have room there to advocate for cervical cancer screening. Okay. There's another question on the age limit for via really. Uh, the age limit is, of course, we said uh, for via really, we will, uh, our target population is 25 to 49. Uh, yeah, that, that is it. That's what we'll go with. But there are circumstances that you, 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 you will see uh, 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 let's say, for example, a 50 year old woman who comes to the clinic, it's important that you insert the speculum. Clam. If you're able to see the squamocolumna junction, you can go ahead and do a via vili. And for women who are HIV, who are HIV positive, you might, you might want to screen them earlier than the 25 years old. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Is it possible to get HPV via the non-sexual route? Uh, 
Okay, it, um, it usually infects the genitals. The, it can also infect the throats, the mouth. Uh, what I want to say is that you don't need to have penetrative sex for you to acquire this virus. That's how, um, that's how infectious it is. Okay. Is there any relationship between contraceptives and cervical cancer? Uh, no, no. Okay. How about girls who are between 20 to 25 and have never been sexually active? Can they be eligible for HPV vaccine? I think I already alluded to that, that yes, in other, in other countries, the vaccine is available even for people outside uh, that nine to 14 age bracket, but it is most effective in, in that nine to 14 age bracket that WHO recommends, reason being uh, sexual debut has been shown in many countries to be, to be below that age. So that is uh, that one. I think we have quite a number of questions. Can cancer recur after treatment? That is the other question. Dr. Amina, yes, so, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, it can recur. But uh, like I said before, we have another webinar scheduled for, for that. Sure. Thank okay. You. Should I be worried about cervical cancer in a patient with huge vaginal warts? Yes, uh, you know, huge vaginal warts is an evidence that this, this woman is infected with uh, type, either type, type uh, 11 or type 6. It's also an evidence that she could be having the other type 16 and 18 that causes cervical cancer and the other, other types. But not necessarily that when they have huge vaginal warts that they have uh, the, the, the oncogenic type of HPV virus. But it's an evidence that they've been exposed before to HPV. The only thing that we don't know is whether they've been exposed to the oncogenic types. Nice. Um, sorry, Dr. Bo, let me a bit take over. Uh, yes. There's an, another interesting question here. It's uh, regarding male circumcision. Does mm -hmm. it reduce women's risk of cervical cancer? You know, we talk a, a lot about HIV transmission. So I'm, I'm curious to know, is there any data that you're aware of any of you two or anybody in the forum? Uh, regarding male circumcision, reducing the rates of risk of cervical cancer. So, so male circumcision does not reduce the risk. Oh, sorry. Yes, it doesn't. It does not, but it reduces the risk of men having penile cancer later in life. Okay, nice. Uh, so I think I think we have so many questions, and, we, and most of them seem very similar in nature and uh, in the interest of good timing, I think uh, we can have one or two people to speak so that we can break the monotony. So the people who've raised up their hands, um, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm allowing you to talk. So kindly unmute yourself. Kindly unmute yourself, Joffrey. Ramesh Patel. And Titus, any of you? Okay, so I, I can see none of them are able to speak. Go. Gaudenia. Hello. Yes, Gaudenia. Hello. Gaudenia. Yes, hello, we can hear you. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, we've had some questions from women or yes. above 50 years, and they have done a total hysterectomy, and they always ask whether they can get cancer of the vaginal wall and whether they can also be screened uh, using via method. 
what what answer could uh, such patients be given? Hello. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you clearly. Robert, do you? Yes, do you I want, want to answer? try and say um, the incidence of vaginal cancer is very low, uh, and if mm -hmm. it's been done total hysterectomy, it means they do not have a cervix. So you don't. What are you mm -hmm. going to screen actually? <laughs> because we are supposed to screen the cervix because that as we saw from the earlier presentation is that the incidence of uh deaths among us um, uh, from 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 cervical cancer are, are number one actually in our country but in terms of incidence of vaginal cancer i they are very low so i don't know we cannot use this one to screen for for vaginal cancer <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, Jessica, I've, and you can you may speak. Yes, I just yeah. want to make a comment. Uh, you know, in the early 1980s, Kenya Medical Women Association were involved in the HPV research in our country. And that's when they noted that HPV was associated with cervical cancer. I don't know if anybody has ever done a follow-up research because that research was uh, uh, they included the department of OBGY, Kenyatta National Hospital. And I remember as a new medical doctor taking a you know, being given the, the role of just uh, trying to recruit women to accept to have a uh, uh, like pop smear uh, in that, uh, in Kenyatta, uh, casualty. And uh, then we used to have a senior civil servants clinic where I was working. And uh, I A lot Sorry, Jessica, um, you may speak. We lost you a little bit. Oh. Yeah. I was just saying that uh, in the early 80s, now, actually to be specific, 1982, 83, 84, Kenya Medical Women as a no, we, we, we got that part, Jessica. Okay, uh, Titus, do you want to speak? Titus. Sasawa, uh, I think uh, Jessica, we have noted your comments. Um, maybe we can address it better in next week's session. Uh, for the CPD points, uh, it will be, give it two weeks, a period of two weeks. For the emailing, uh, it's going to be a bit, we'll, we'll probably have a technical challenge in terms of sending emails to everybody, but this video is usually uploaded in the KNH website. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, despite your cold. We are hoping you're, you're free of uh, the infamous virus. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much, despite you not feeling very well, to, to come and give us this very informative talk. Dr. Bor, thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, and thank you for co-moderating. Um, maybe I can give one more person. Francis, you can speak. I have given you. Um, you can unmute yourself. I guess it's usually challenging for people to unmute themselves on the webinar. However, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we'll have, I hope you have a nice weekend. Uh, we meet next week. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.